Hi everybody, Adrian Cass here. Yes, and Bridget, hi. Yeah. And here we are in week 12. Week 12. Of Sounding the Shadows. Mm. Uh, and as usual, we've had some really good communication, haven't we? Well, we have, based people. on what we were talking about last week, mainly, obviously some other things. But we were talking about pirates and treasure. Pirates and treasure. Mm. And uh, uh, one th thing we have was very moving, really. It was from a friend of ours who's sadly uh, has lost her husband, who's died. Um, but they were so in love, you know. And she talked about how she used to walk past him as he sat in his chair yeah, his towards, the end, chair, yeah. towards the end of his life and just ruffle his hair. And she'd say, you're my treasure. And he'd say, where did you dig me up? <laughs> yes. I was so, so lovely. I if you knew them, you would be able to hear hear their voices yeah. clearly saying, yeah. saying those things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And although he's died, they just were so blessed to have that time, weren't they? Yeah. But I mean, it wasn't just something as beautiful as that. There were one or two quite disturbing things. But I found this so interesting. Somebody sent us a poem she'd written called Pirates, which we'd really like to read to you. Pirates. They crept into my room again last night cover of darkness somehow seeming their natural habitat. No brightly coloured cheerful cartoon characters but dark in origin and intent. Whispering words I know are lies but fear are truths. Refrain born long ago in the darkness of a childhood marked by pain. A melody that echoes in my bruised and hurting heart. But yet Refusing to be silenced, there is another sound, a gentler tone, a pure, sweet note, in contrast to their discordant mutterings. And so, with every fibre of my being, I listen, blocking out all other sounds but this, your voice of love. I think what struck me reading at this time, Adrian, is just that there was a decision there to listen a decision to determinedly seek mm. yeah, it's very something very necessary solid. sometimes. I mean, if you can manage what that person manages there, that's fine. But we know lots of people don't, and I don't. I certainly don't manage that all the time. But I, we were thinking uh, about treasure last week, and after that, I, I really thought about um, what is my treasure, not what should be, mm. but what is what. What r is really valuable to me in my in my life, mm. um, and it's very interesting to open my treasure chest oh. and see what was in there. Oh, am I in your treasure chest? Yes, Adrian? you take up most of the space in there. <laughs> That's very rude, <laughs> darling. Come you on. You know what I mean. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I do. Oh, no. right. Well, there was a there was a yeah. Of course, you're in my treasure chest, but <clears throat> there are a number of other things. Some are things that you might think should be and some are just there because they're mm. important um one that you might think is important is communion and we talked about that last week yeah you we? did you talked about meeting god in communion somebody reminded us of a of something that c.s lewis said well I, I it's almost not meeting god it, it is meeting god but it, it's just being aware of something profound profoundly right in the center of things mm. uh, it's it's hard mm. to describe but yes c.s lewis, lewis said this and it, it echoes almost exactly what uh, what we feel lewis said i find no difficulty in believing that the veil between the worlds is nowhere else so thin and permeable to divine operation mm. here a hand from the hidden country touches not only my soul but my body. Mm. And someone sent that uh, mm. quote to me. So mm. thank you very much for that. And Lewis is also in my treasure chest. You and he <laughs> in my treasure. There's a thought. <laughs> um, and uh, just watch what you're up to in the treasure chest with C.S. <laughs> Lewis. Um, there's a there's a very childlike thing about Lewis in my own mind, which I think is, is a lot of people have. He is an anchor point in my mind mm. because he was an incredibly clever incredibly widely read man uh, and his intellect and that breadth of knowledge was not a barrier to faith yeah. and however 
silly that sounds, I, I lean my head on that pillow and have done for years. Yeah, I don't think it's silly at all, really. I think there was one point, wasn't there, when we were kind of told that we had to be a fool for Christ. And in some way, it was very easy to think that that meant you had to sort of push down anything that didn't fit with giving up everything you thought. Uh, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, w I heard, oh, I think we both did some time ago, about, it was Elaine Storkey, wasn't it, who's a lecturer at Oxford, and she's a, a, a very, when I say fundamental Christian, I don't mean silly, I mean somebody who truly believes it in her heart, and she, she was really being pursued by the atheists on the staff who genuinely could not understand how somebody of such brilliant, such a brilliant mind mm. could believe something that they saw as nonsense. And after a really long day, her response to them was, I have decided to believe. And that has helped me so much. There is a decision at times when everything's flailing around to think, but I made that decision and I will stick by that decision. Yeah. That, she, that that was the anchor point, the thing that she went to to hold her together, really. Yes, it's very interesting. And I don't even... I mean, she actually uh, told me that story. But, uh, and um, I also, both of us really have kept that in our minds uh, ever since. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that process means because I think there's something in the decision-making that, that fulfills... fulfills the thing that you're you're looking for you're you're hoping for somehow mm. it, is, it isn't a game it, it kind of brings it nearer it's an odd thing i'll tell you something else that happened to me this week and i was writing to my brother about this and trying to <laughs> trying to make it clear what happened it's absurd i mean i was in the as you know i was in our shed at the bottom of the garden uh trying to make up a a, a a, sh a shelf unit. <laughs> yes, you do have to and begin by um, saying you are my, the my, least practical person yeah, in my, the universe. Well, I don't know about that, but my my yeah my DIY skills are extremely low. Um, I think I have said before WD forty. I always thought was a postcode until someone <laughs> got me right. But anyway, so I'm I could only do it on the floor, and it it crept towards me as I made it bigger and it filled the floor. So <laughs> by the time I got to the, the last bit, I was in a little coffin at the end. <laughs> and because my le legs aren't good, I was lying on the floor <laughs> with a, um, an Allen key, as we experts call it, uh, <laughs> trying to put the last four screws in. And mm. I thought, this is a piece of cake now because I've just got to put one of these screws in each corner, do them with the Allen key, that's it finished well the thing is when you do the final four screws and i promise you this is a fascinating story in the end um the 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 shelf or the unit whatever it is you're doing doesn't like it okay because all your little errors and imperfections that you thought would be all right you've left a dowel out a dowel is a piece of wood you put in a hole by the way um the whole thing groans and shrieks and creaks and protests against the fact you're trying to screw it together right. when it's not ready to be screwed together <laughs> so it took me longer I, I'm not kidding you to put those four screws in uh. than the time I taken that morning <laughs> building the shelf unit and in the end I did it and I collapsed in my coffin and finally managed to get myself out but and, and it was done but I, I think one of the things that we have to learn in the in as we sort through the debris that has occurred as a result of the covid thing mm. is um where we've where we've made things up or mm. taken things in that don't really fit mm. and now trying to make it make sense trying to screw it together mm. uh, it's not going to be like that mm. really mm. Mm. Um, uh, I think unfortunately probably... it's not going to depend on our DIY skills no unfortunately I mean, it's, it's not interesting that, really yeah. uh, an anchor point as far as I can gather you mentioned an anchor point and that is something that's often attached to roofs to to then put things ropes on to hold people it is the thing that stops everything from falling to pieces rather like the screws that you were putting in and I, I think yeah, there is a parable there. There always is, isn't there? That if you think of God as an anchor point, then he's holding together all our imperfections because we are somehow attached to him and it's going to stop us from falling apart completely. And I was thinking, 
It's a funny little image, but sometimes when we're talking to people who really feel that they are genuinely falling apart, we talk about holding people on a string because we're holding them and then we're holding on to God for them for a while. And I know there have been times for me when I've needed to know somebody else is holding on to the anchor point mm -hmm. and I'm just holding on to them. And that comes back in a way to you talking about people like C.S. Lewis, doesn't it? You know, uh, putting down an anchor, if we move from that, if oh, we better be a bit nautical, Adrian, <laughs> is to do with stopping you from drifting, isn't it? You yeah, know, if you're in true, a boat. True. And so putting down an anchor. Yes. I mean, I grew up in Norfolk with terrible tides around that coast. And I know about drifting because you could go into the water at one point and you could come out somewhere totally different. Um, and like you say, that's what COVID has done. It's kind of pulled us away from everything that was familiar. And we can feel that we want something solid to hold us secure. And it's quite difficult at the moment for some people, including for us quite a lot of the time, to feel we are holding on mm -hmm. to something that is immovable and will stop us from falling. And continuing the anchor oh, we've got metaphor, to. which we must, um, <laughs> uh, anchors are, are we, uh, we know as much about sailing as I do about DIY, I have to add. <laughs> We know a bit we more since we started that, doing this. Um, <laughs> but anchors are, are not intended. I, I think this is so important. They're not intended to fix us in one place forever. And no. people talk, where is my anchor? This is where I stick. Oh, well, yeah. you don't, do you? They're, they are what we carry with us. Yes. Ready to use when we need them to be anchors. Yeah. And that's completely different. And another of my things in my treasured chest which is, a, in that sense, an anchor, is the Gospels. Mm. And I'll tell you briefly how. Um, for, for whatever reason, when I read the words of Jesus and read about what he did during those th three years, um, it's always a support for me. There's, there's an inbuilt authority in it that, that, that always has that effect. It isn't because um, I always like what he says or does on the contrary there are some points at which i'm i do part company with jesus or the jesus i want to know which mm. is very interesting mm. and actually the actually embracing and giving real thought to those paradoxes actually can mm. be very helpful well, but some overall, of the stories are pretty difficult oh, you, oh, some you know of they're not all fluffy at quite all are brutal, they? i think yeah but there is this air of authority and i can lean on that without any strain as long as i um, really reading it, thinking about it, mm. chewing it, mm. not liking it, liking mm. it. In, in other words, mm. being honest with the text. Mm. I think, yeah. yeah, I mean, it takes you back to somewhere where you can put down an anchor, doesn't it, if you like. It's, it's, it's okay. But I, I think one of the things that struck me over the time is when I first became a Christian, there was a sense that the anchor of the word sort of was so solidly there mm. that it almost could imprison you in a place or a time if you see what I mean and and I think what I've come to I'm not sure if I've said it very clearly really but I think I've come to realize that the Bible the whole Bible is the story of an unchanging God but then people and societies are constantly changing and I'm on a timeline somewhere which isn't where Ruth was or Mary was or Dorcas was you know I mean if I'd been born in the timeline of where Mary was women were still separated from the inner temple and probably couldn't read and were uneducated and all sorts of things that's not where I am so Taking the anchor of the Bible means taking it with me into my situation. Yeah. Now, does well, that make it less strong? No, I well, don't that's think what so. we were just trying to say that you take your anchor with you. you yeah. Your anchor is not living the way you've always lived. Or I mean, the we, way we they know, lived 2,000 years we ago. We know people who, who won't go to the cinema or, or drink alcohol because they were brought up like that. And yeah. those principles are stronger than, than the center of their faith. Yeah. So, Finding what your anchor really is is really, is really important. I'll tell you something else that was in my treasure chest. Do you want to know something else? <laughs> yes, I like the idea of something else being in there it was, with uh, me and C.S. Lewis. <laughs> yes, it was uh, poetry. Uh. Um, and I think in what we call Bible study, and which, I mean, we love the Bible. Um, we, we use it, we read it, we're always going on about it. But... I know there are times when our 
if I may call it, our groaning humanity mm. demands that we find um, a way to open the windows and let, let light, light in, shine yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. And the poem we read last week, Kath's poem, do you remember, about <sighs> slapping Jesus? Um, Jared Manley Hopkins, th do you know that one line, glory be to God for dappled things? Mm. That is such a support to me mm. because it's an ebullient, uh, enthusiastic wonder mm. at something that is truly beautiful. Mm. Mm. If you read a poem like Fern Hill, mm. see, uh, Dylan mm. Thomas, mm. Uh, and many others. And you're a words man, aren't you? I was thinking even as you were saying that, for somebody else it might be colour, it might be... It might be we often talk about the natural world, but something that does exactly what you're saying and opens the windows Absolutely. and allows yeah. light in. Yeah, yeah. and the, the paradox about those things and about uh, good poetry, or poetry in particular, is that it encapsulates, it, it, it puts something very special into, um, a, as Dylan Thomas put it, human coils mm. of thought and feeling. Mm. Um, but mm. it also unlocks and opens up mm. uh, and I think that's one as you said but many sorts of things mm. do, do that same mm. thing we have one or two friends who are painters I'm sure they would find a different way of putting the same of thing of course they would yeah come on um, then what else okay. is in there uh, love people who go on loving me even especially when they know uh, how unlovable I can be right you find that hard to believe <laughs> well family family have got to be in there and ideally church family but I'll tell you something I was thinking, you know, we've mentioned once or twice going to Bangladesh. And do you remember we went up to an area called Tuatal? And Tuatal is in the middle well, of the great yeah. puddle. Yeah. I mean, Bangladesh is essentially one big puddle, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it, it has regular flooding. And if you remember, there were those little hills where, where, so the buildings, any little houses were built on little hills and actually attached to the house on dry land was a little boat. Because those people knew that when, when the floods came, they would lift the anchor, and they would their boat would help them to escape to safety and to a new place. And there are times, aren't there, where you have to lift anchor and escape danger. It was I the most odd sight, wasn't it? I remember those very yeah, well. Those those yeah. islands. Yeah. But I mean, there are times when it is as drastic as escaping a flood. Now, it could be your church, which is an extraordinary thing to say, really. But the very church that is supposed to keep you safe and be your anchor and absorb you even when you're unlovable can be the thing that is abusive. A family relationship can be, and even on occasions, a marriage can be that. Oh, absolutely. And then yeah. you take yeah. your anchor, your ultimate security with you. You don't leave him behind and think he won't want to be with me anymore because of what I've done. It's fascinating, really. Um, one last thing, perhaps. Um, I was thinking about the pain of God. Okay. Um, the the suffering of God. I mean, um, in, I mean, I I was brought up in a a Christian culture that, by and large, really never spoke about the vulnerability of of God. Yes. And I think it's interesting that if you if you enter. I, I say this with respect. I mean, I, um, God is God, all right? That if you enter into the hurt and the disappointment and the pain mm. in the heart of God, mm. it offers a, um, a strange sense of safety and community, mm -hmm. which maybe nothing else did, mm. it does. Uh, we'll just finish with this poem. It's called Forgive Us If We Say, and it's really about that. Forgive us if we say we want to take you in our arms. Sad father, weeping God, breathless with the storms of anger or compassion, fists clenched hard around your grief, around the marks, the cost, the proof. How can you give us up? How can you hand us over? Of course you never can, never could, never will. Burdened with perfection and with passion, lay your head down. Let us hold you just for a little while, and we will try to be to you 
what you have been to us so many times. Peace, Lord. Be a child once again. Do you remember Mary's arms? Of course you do. So warm, so different. So rest quietly, and soon you will once again be a lion thundering from way beyond the east, and we will come trembling from the west, we promise you, like birds, like doves, like children who have suddenly remembered who it was who taught them how to laugh. Mm. But just for now, just for now, forgive us if we say, we want to take you in our arms, sad father, weeping God. Mm. That's beautiful, Adrian. And of course, one last thing is Hebrews says that hope is an anchor. And I thought maybe the beginning of next week will uh, will tell people about some hamsters, one of whom was called <laughs> Hope. Oh, yeah. But it would be really good to hear what other people, when they think about their anchor, mm -hmm. what do they think? So that yeah. would be great too. Happy and lovely. we'll talk to you next week. See you next week. Bye-bye.